Welcome everybody to this month's webinars for busy lawyers. We're really delighted to bring this program to you each month. We present a webinar that's about 20 minutes long and then there's time afterwards for Q&A. They're extremely popular because at the end you'll walk away with tips to put into practice immediately. Uh, today I have the pleasure of introducing Russell Matson. Russell has defended clients in every district court in Massachusetts, facing a wide variety of misdemeanor and felony criminal charges, including hundreds of OUI cases. He has an extensive record of outstanding results for his clients. He's the author of a book on winning at the clerk magistrate's hearing. Outside of his practice, he is the co-founder of a legal lead generation business that focuses on using technology solutions to bring the client to you. Get Lawyer Leads, and you can find that at getlawyerleads.com, acts as a digital pipeline where they connect warm leads of potential clients seeking assistance to lawyers who are ready to help. I wanna remind you that if you have questions, pull up your chat box, put your question right into that chat box, and at the end of Russell's presentation, I will convey all the questions to Russell and he will turn them, he will answer them all for you. So no worries about that. And uh, now, Russell, are you ready? Yes, thank you, Susan. Take it away. Okay, so marketing automation. It's really hard to separate marketing automation from automating any other part of the law practice because they all sort of tie together. But it comes down to what is it, what problem are you sort of trying to solve here? For most people, uh, either they don't have enough clients or they don't have exactly the clients they want or they're not charging enough. And automation can help you make a lot of progress towards those things. It probably can't solve the problem of you're in the wrong market, but it's useful. I find it just incredibly useful and I find it also fun, which is probably one of the reasons I find it incredibly useful. Uh, and basically in marketing, ideally you want to have some sort of story and you want to amplify it and make it better. And there's, uh, most of this will be about, you know, the tools to do that. But I still use paper sometimes. Uh, like if I go to the gym, I will have a pad with me. I use a lot of whiteboards. It's really more about capturing ideas and technology is usually the best way to do that. And here are some of those, uh, here are some of those technologies. Uh, I'm gonna give another plug for it. New toys are fun. I just like new toys. And for me, if I am working on a problem, if I'm working on how to automate things, sometimes I will find something new. Like lately I've been playing a lot with text expander and even though OneNote is on the Microsoft suite, I've just sort of switched to that as a note-taking app. Um, and I've been using the mobile, I've been using a much more mobile apps, including for WordPress, for, uh, for my websites. So just, I play with new stuff and in, in the process of figuring out, I write a bunch of content. Um, ironically, sometimes I switch from something to something else. And after I spend a lot of time at it, I get a lot done and I say, oh, you know, I could have done it with the old thing, but, <laughs> but I spent years with it. I never did. So sometimes, so that's sort of one sort of plug for, uh, for switching things that are cheap and there's not too much sunk cost in. Um, and one of the things about automation is you want to be uh, practicing at the top of your law license. Hopefully, if you've been doing this for a while, there are things that you know pretty well. And, you sh and I find the process of automating them, and I say, when I say automating them, if I'm answering a client question, um, usually I've done it before. And probably there's some sort of web page I've written about it, and I mentioned Text Expander, where I text lots of people. Now, um, with that, um, that's like shorthand where you just type in a few letters and then your two sentences or paragraph come right out. Um, 
and actually, I'm going to go back to what I was saying a little bit earlier about reaching the ideal clients. For me, I rep because I'm a geek, I represent lots of coders and engineers and people that give presentations. And I found it actually useful to a couple people. I had them just take a look at this and sort of give me their, their take. Uh, so that's what I was saying earlier about marketing automation. If you like it, you will find, you can automate lots of things and you can attract people who can help you do this. All right, so. Marketing funnels. Um, it's helpful to break down every part of the marketing process. So this can include awareness, which there's a lot of different ways to do it. Actually, the non-technical way to do it, there's absolutely nothing wrong with people who's, I know people that do it a lot and they're good at it. They just go out and have coffee with lots of people and develop lots of long-standing relationships. That is a perfectly fine way to do things. And they send people handwritten notes, nothing wrong with that. Um, for making people aware, uh, Google, you've probably heard of it. Um, it is incredibly helpful because even if people sort of know about you, um, the decision-making process over time has sort of gotten more complicated. Years ago, uh, it was just, oh, uh, you know, you heard a name of a lawyer, you would go to the person's office and often that was it. Now, even if you get, even if, someone recommends you a lot of times they will go to your website so it can be helpful to have some good stuff on there um, and now this is really going to depend on your area of practice for some areas of practice like like mine uh, mostly people make quick decisions they'll go to that web page uh, and they have a court date coming up in a short period of time um, but for other areas of law you can people can have these email marketing campaigns that sort of you have a lead, you have a prospect, you send them a series of emails and they, over time, um, over time, they will be more likely to make a decision because you are top of mind. Um, and at the, so you do the case and sort of the end of the funnel is hopefully people give you a good review on Google, which sort of uh, renews or repeats the process. Okay, so lead generation. Um, how you generate leads is going to vary greatly upon your area of practice. I'm going to talk a little bit about criminal defense since that's what I've mostly done my entire career. Uh, and some people's lead generation are they do court appointed cases. That certainly works to some extent. The court sends your cases, that's it. Um, you can also buy leads. There are services out there where you're just literally paying you pay them X dollars per lead and you get a lead. Um, you, some people use like AVVO and there are other services like that that aren't just pure lead generation. You pay some money for some placement. And even for those, marketing automation can be helpful. Um, it can be really, you can have lots of tricks and you can spend lots of money on the process. But the more you do it yourself and the more you really understand your story and can hone your message, the more likely it is you're gonna get a good return. And the other thing is, I wish I could just say, here are the magical three things that work. The reality is, it's incredibly helpful, virtually essential for you to track every part of your marketing funnel and every part of the lead generation process um, because you may have some, some sources that send you a lot of leads, but the cases don't convert at nearly as good of a rate as other sources, or the cases aren't as big. Uh, when talking to people, you hear, you, I see and hear this all the time. People will tell me about the marketing. Oh, you know, this one was great. I paid her this much. It worked. And then it didn't work. And they start thinking, oh, you know, the, the woman or guy, they're a thief now. And a lot of times what happens is just there are various marketing channels. Uh, there's Google Organic, there's Google Paid, depending on your area of practice, there's YouTube, there's Pinterest, there's TikTok, and there's lots of different online sources. And what happens is um, what, there are channels 
and they get, at first, lawyers get a good return on it, they figured something out, and then the word spreads and the channel gets saturated and then the channel simply becomes less effective. So hopefully you're getting leads from a variety of sources and you're tracking them because uh, you want to know as quickly as possible that one source is becoming less effective. And in addition, there are advantages to having multiple sources because hopefully they're not all going to dry up at the same time. Uh, but even then, um, the data will tell you something and hopefully you're making decisions as early as possible based upon trends you just see developing rather than, holy crap, I'm looking at my, you know, why am I not making any money? <laughs> you know, hopefully you can sort of adjust your marketing strategy and cut your costs earlier rather than later. Oh, one other thought about lead generation. There's always new stuff coming out, like I said. Now, advertising on Facebook and stuff, it just gets more and more refined. You can advertise to narrower and narrower audiences. You can even do uh, one trick I learned about recently was geofencing, where you can advertise to incredibly narrow physical places. Um, I haven't done it yet, but I think it might be interesting to advertise literally to just a courthouse, like the smallest area on a courthouse. Um, there are other areas of law where, yes, I could imagine saying there are hearings here. Um, that is what I am going to advertise to. Okay, so content marketing. We all have the same amount of hours in a day and hours in a week. And we're all sort of making trade-offs. Um, we're spending time on making content. We're spending time on dealing with clients. We're spending time on intake. And your strategy is going to sort of depend on where you are. Having said that, the people I know that are really good at making content themselves cheaply, that tends to work out very well. Far more often, the, I see people that try to outsource it, that want, yeah, far more often I see people that they're like, I'm a lawyer, all I wanna do is, is practice law, and they ignore the business aspects. But like I said, um, just content is, you're getting your story out there. That story can be people you've helped before. Uh, that story can be, here is, here is this particular law or statute and here is how it may apply to your situation. And I find that sometimes, for me, it's also just about sort of getting a rough draft, getting something done quickly. So like I was, I think I mentioned before, uh, WordPress just having a mobile app where I have an idea and I want there to be as little friction as possible, as short a time as possible between I have an idea, I will press the button and I will dictate a web page. Now it's just a rough draft and maybe someone later on in the process will clean it up. But even then, if you outsource your web stuff and your search engine optimization, it can be incredibly helpful for you to understand, do a bunch of the work yourself and understand that process. Because if you think your guy that does um, websites for a, restaurants and a dentist office and you understand your vertical as well as you, that is probably not the case. And I find that if I'm going to um, dictate stuff on a web page, then I may just quickly use my iPhone, just hit YouTube, hit YouTube and record a video. And sort of weirdly, if I'm doing something in a different format, different things come out. And as I was saying before about tracking things, uh, you will find that you will get different response rates on different mediums and ways that are sort of hard to know. And one final thing about content, I find that I try to break my clients into categories and I try to have sort of analogies and stories that are sort of specific to them. You know, my geeky engineer and coders things, I will make coding references to Stack Overflow, which anyway, that's not a thing anyone's gonna, gonna know about but them, but I find that stuff can connect deeply. We are in Boston, so it is also not unusual that we find people in education, so you can talk about educational, I talk about educational analogies and I can sort of put stuff out there 
Um, I also see lots of medical people. So I find that it is, the markets just get narrower and narrower and we wanna market more towards niches if possible. Okay, so there's a lot of different ways for you to take notes. Um, lately, I've been doing lots of OneNote, um, but mostly I find these things and I've tried, I've tried all of them. Mostly they're pretty comparable. And the thing to do is just have, is just have it be a habit. Um, I find the movie Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross to be hilarious. And one thing that, that one phrase that is repeated there at infinite is always be closing. What applies to note kicking is, is not ABC always be closing, it's ABC always be collecting. When you are doing something, um, it is incredibly helpful to just take that down and then later use it for uh, dealing with clients in an automated way later on or making content. And intake. Uh, there are lots of different ways to do intake depending on where you are in your law practice. Uh, if you are answering the phone live, you're probably doing it wrong. There may be some exceptions, but um, depending on where you are, it is not always true, but it is often true that your first employee should be someone who is uh, answering the phone. And depending on your vertical, it can be very helpful to actually record those calls, again, depending on a whole bunch of disclaimers, to, to know exactly what is going on. Uh, and it can also be, yeah, it can be helpful to provide them the script so you know exactly what is happening. Um, I do lots of intake via text uh, where I will have like a virtual receptionist screen the call. And I was, I mentioned text expander earlier. I've been messing with that for a month and I just love it to death. I find that in my vertical, I generate lots of leads, maybe 10% of the people hire me. So that's different from other industries or sources of leads where if, you know, if you're getting referrals, oftentimes your the rate that referrals um, close is closer to 60% than 10%. Uh, so part of the reason that I use text for intake is I screen out people that are not very good leads. But even then I find that just And one, the, the magical question I found is, can you text me a paperwork? Because I find that people that actually have a court date upcoming are much more likely to hire me than people that are panicking about some crime that hasn't been charged, which is probably not going to be charged. Um, but whatever intake method you're doing, I would suggest it's very helpful to track it very carefully because that is the first contact you will have with people. And your con the content you put out there will drive the kind of intake you do and your intake will drive the content that you put out afterwards. And especially, hopefully what you are doing is you are taking in information from a client and using it for document automation later on so that you get the first stuff, you get the name, you're collecting the email, which you can maybe use later on for email marketing. Um, you can perhaps use the, the uh, whatever form that they responded in to ask them for review later on at the end of the case. Um, like I was saying before, always be collecting. And your sales process is going to vary very widely depending on what industry, what, you know, what your clients are. Uh, I used to have hundred, we used to, I used to get hundreds of criminal cases a year and I had various salespeople working for me. Uh, with crime going down, I'm doing most of that now. Uh, but whatever your system, it's very useful to use technology in the sales process. Uh, I 
until recently, in fact, I'm still using Salesforce. I've been using Salesforce for 15 years as a, uh, to sort of track the leads. I'm in the process of switching over to Clio Grow. And that is interesting because Salesforce is not something that is specifically designed for lawyers, whereas Clio is. And when you have time to switch over, it's amazing the things that you learn and the blind spots you see. You're like, oh, here's this tool I used to use to sell the process. Um, it was hard for me to tell people from this area how likely they were to hire me or people with this crime, how likely they were to hire me. Now something else is set up so that it's sort of super easy to do that. Uh, and knowing how you best sell, you know, how to best sell to prospective clients will then inform the intake process a little bit earlier on and will form the content process later on. Um, Electronic signatures, having people sign retained remotely, I find that to be incredibly helpful. I don't know how true this will be for other people in other areas of law, but I actually, most of the time, I never even talk to my clients before they retain me. It's all, I mean, I will occasionally, but mostly it's all text. Here's the link to the payment. Here's the thing you sign. Uh, here's some picture, you know, here's a, I will occasionally send pictures. I will, in fact, sometimes send absolutely goofy pictures to people. If they are sort of concerned that sometimes if people are anxious, um, I will truthfully say, I can't talk to you right now. I'll send them a goofy picture of me with my daughter. I'm watching her. And that makes the process of, you know, texting it out. Uh, that makes sense to them as to why I can't talk to them. So I mentioned this earlier, I just love this product. I think it costs a whopping $4 a month, though I understand there are competitors that, uh, that will do it for free. Um, and I love this for a variety of reasons. It has forced me to think deeply about the sales process. I use it more for intake and getting clients than existing clients, though I do use it for existing clients to some extent, and it's just, like I said, here's a sentence or two or a paragraph. Instead of typing the whole sentence through a paragraph, I just type three or four letters and then it magically comes up. Um, and whenever I use, like I said, whenever you use a new tool, it forces you to think really deeply about the process. And when you can start to look at numbers and data, you find things that you never ever would have found otherwise uh, using that brain of yours. Yeah, so hopefully most of you are using a case management system. Uh, I personally have been using Clio. It is not the only choice in the market. There's plenty of other good things. Leap is a thing that people say nice things about. Filevine is something I've heard good things about for PI. There's Rocket Matter. There's a whole bunch of them. But broadly speaking, hopefully you take in information and are, like I said before, you use it many times in many context. It is just super useful to get the information initially and be able to press a button and have every court document you ever need just automatically come up because it's all preset. Um, I'm hard pressed to imagine a situation where you're not going to benefit from a case management system. Uh, it's, it's incredibly useful for a solo. And the bigger you get, the more, I mean, and as you get bigger, you will find that it is very useful in saving labor costs. It's much easier to, to train people to say, here, here is the workflow, here are the tasks that need to be done in this order. And if it automatically is generated, that's helpful. It's super helpful if you have a pair, you know, you may have a paralegal or someone that can do 80 or 90% of the work hand it to you and then you just have to sort of use your use your lawyer brain to practice the top of your law license to get you know the extra 10 or 20 percent uh, 
So hopefully after your workflow, people will say nice things about you and write a good review for you. Uh, this process can be sort of automated where I just send an auto, I mean, I will, depending on the situation, I will verbally ask people at the end of the case, or I will text them a link saying, you know, can you, can you give me a Google review? Uh, and another plug for text expander. And last month I've gotten a couple of Google reviews from people that I wouldn't have talked to otherwise. They were just essentially on some level wasting my time with free advice, which I wouldn't have done previously, but since most of my advice was already automated, I made them feel a lot better. Uh, and in a short period of time, they said, great, you solved my problem, it didn't cost me any money. And when they texted me that right back, I was like, can you send me, can you give me a good review on Google? And that worked, so, uh, and that is something that just wouldn't have happened if it was not all automated. Uh, referrals are good. There are lots of ways to uh, ask for referrals from people. Um, and I, in my area of law, I don't really use email drip campaigns, but it can be very helpful for referrals if you just sort of have a process where you send a bunch of automated emails to people. At the end of the case, you automatically ask for a referral. Um, and those are just the best those are just the best leads out there. Um, all right, yeah, I don't care about that slide. Common mistakes. So this is going to vary depending on sort of where you are. But lots of times people get paralyzed about, I know I have this problem. There's a bunch of different ways I should solve it. And they will spend months talking to a bunch of different people about, about what, you know, how do I take notes or what, and a bigger decision, it's understandable why people get stuck on it is which uh, case management system to use. The vast majority of the time, it's better to just pick one quickly and move on rather than agonize over the choice made. Again, there are some exceptions, but you're generally going to be better off by trying a bunch of new stuff, you know, with the caveat that hopefully there is the learning curve isn't too high and hopefully the thing you're picking doesn't lock you into some crazy long contract, which makes it difficult to, spit, to switch. Uh, I'm a huge fan of paying monthly for things rather than yearly. Places will suck you in and say, oh, well, you know, a year prepay, it will be 20% cheaper or even, even more. A lot of times it just doesn't make any sense. Um, because if you do that, you're sort of locked into something which may or may not be optimal. Whereas if you do monthly expenses, you are more likely to have the option to switch or get some new thing that, that solves the problem. Having said that, most of the time, if you have a monthly cloud service, some sort of automated technology that, that solves the problem, some people will be unhappy with one and they'll switch to another and they'll spend way too way more time than they need to be doing that. Broadly speaking, most of the time, you are better off, instead of directly replacing something, finding other parts of your practice to automate first and then maybe looping back. And a lot of times, just things that you rely on, um, you can sort of phase out and get a new system that that replaces it indirectly before before sort of completely replacing it directly. Um, and one product I don't have a specific slide for, but is sort of key to automation is called Zapier. Zapier is a product that ties various systems together. So my sales force talks to Clio via Zapier. Um, Lots of things talk to Clio via Zapier. Lots of things talk to Salesforce via Zapier. It's basically you do something in one computer program and then it automatically shows up another one. Uh, it is invaluable for creating workflow. And very broadly, automation works because once you have a process down, 
you know, the computer system will get it right 99 out of 100 times or more, depending on the situation, whereas we humans are just fallible. Um, we will, you know, have these pesky, irritating things called emotions. We will get distracted. So essentially, anything that can be automated will be automated. And once it can be automated, if you are a, if there's lots of competitors in your market that do it quicker than you, that is not a spot that you particularly want to put yourself in. Uh, I prefer the problems that a tech savvy early adopter gets over someone that is uh, slow to do that. Though there are certainly people out there that enjoy what they do and they're making a pile of money and they say, why change? Um, well, first of all, they may be right. They may not have to, but eventually uh, your lead and niche is likely to start going to people that, that uh, have automated things. Okay, and this is sort of my last uh, slide. Social media is a complicated topic, but much of it can be automated. If I was to look at all the technologies and say, which technology is likely to be a giant waste of time? I might pick this one. It can work. It often does work, but it's rare you find someone that says, you know, I just love Zapier so much, I waste a lot of time on it. I just love my case management system for I've just found myself distracted for hours. Social media, people will check you out on it. You probably want to have something uh, on there for a variety of reasons. You want to think about what you're doing, but it wouldn't be the first place I would look at my law practice to tweak. All right, so I have come to the end of the presentation. I encourage questions, and I guess we are waiting for Susan to jump back on here. I'm right here. Thank you, Russell. That was really informative. Um, we're going to wait a little bit to see if any questions pop up. In the meantime, um, I was wondering, you mentioned about breaking clients into categories um, and defining niches. How would you recommend um, somebody go about figuring out, you know, what categories um, they should be thinking, what criteria they should look for, and how they should divide up clients? Well, I'm going to give you the classic lawyer's answer. Well, it depends. Now, uh, if you're just starting out, that's going to be a hard thing to do. If you have represented lots of people, hopefully you have some sort of intake system or case management system that you've been collecting data on who you've been representing, what occupation they are, and how big the cases are. If you haven't been doing that, you can rely just on the on human brain and say, what clients have I liked? You know, what cases have been satisfying and use a whiteboard or a piece of paper to sort of figure that out. Um, so there's a bunch of different ways to solve that problem. Okay. All right. Um, I know you mentioned that you think most people would really benefit from some type of case management software, and you mentioned a, a bunch. I just wanted to throw out for our Massachusetts people, um, if you're a member of Social Law Library, Zola Suite, which is a really nice product, is a member benefit. So it's basically 25 bucks and end of story, you've got Zola Suite. And it, I believe it's for you and maybe two other lawyers in your firm and maybe a support person. So it's a really nice, benefit, it will save you a little bit of money. Um, and I couldn't agree with Russell more. Uh, it will make your life much easier and your practice much more organized. So, yeah, yeah go ahead. I, I just have one brief response to that. I've heard some good things about it. And my guess is, if you're not doing anything, signing up for Zolo Suite very quickly is not going to be a mistake mm -hmm. because it's so cheap and you'll figure some stuff out. Um, yeah, especially if it's 25 bucks a month and there is no... Not a, for a month. It's one time $25 fee, end of story, free. Oh, wow. Yeah. It's hard to compete with that. And it, yes. You make a really good point about just trying it out and, and see how you feel. Yeah. 
Um, I don't see that we have any questions. Um, I just want to thank you again, Russell. Remind everybody also that what we will be doing is we will be posting uh, a PDF of the slides and a recording of today's presentation up on our website. It will probably be after the holidays, um, but it will be there. You can access it anytime you want. Um, I want to wish everybody happy holidays, um, happy New Year, Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, Happy Kwanzaa, whatever uh, you're celebrating, it's a great time of year, enjoy. And I wanna remind you that next month on January 22nd, Natalie Kelly will be joining us and the title of her presentation is How Not to Reinvent the Wheel Using Today's Technology to Streamline Your Practice. Um, so happy holidays, everybody. Thanks for joining us today and have a great afternoon. All right, thank you.